The following video is sponsored by InstantMaddenCoins.com. The only place to get Madden Coins instantly on every console and platform is InstantMaddenCoins.com. Use code CLICKWID at checkout for a 10% discount. Hey, what is going on, guys? ClickWid here, back again with another NFL prediction video for you guys today. We are going to be taking a look at Super Bowl 51. Last night, we saw the New England Patriots lock up their ticket to the Super Bowl, and earlier in the day, the Atlanta Falcons defeating the Green Bay Packers to punch their ticket to the Super Bowl. So those are the two teams that we have competing for the Super Bowl, the coveted Lombardi Trophy this season, guys. New England against Atlanta. It's going to be a fun game, I believe. I think this is definitely one of the best Super Bowl matchups that we have had in a long time. So I personally am very, very excited about this. Despite the fact that my Cowboys aren't in it, it's all right. Uh, the salt is gone, guys. The salt is gone. <laughs> but what we're going to be doing today is giving you guys my prediction as to what's going to happen in this game. I will be giving you guys a winner and a final score as well. We're also going to take a look at some of the most important matchups that will lead into Super Bowl 51. Offensive and defensive key matchups. I think those are going to be the things to really pay attention to in this video. Now guys, if you are enjoying this video at any time, please do me a favor and drop a like on it. And of course, leave a comment below. I want to hear from you guys. What is your prediction for Super Bowl 51? Who do you think is going to win and what is the final score? And also, who do you think is going to win MVP? All right, guys, let's get into the game. Guys, this is the most exciting, like I said, Super Bowl matchup that I have seen in quite a long time. We're seeing the NFL's number one scoring offense against the number one scoring defense in the NFL this season. Obviously, Atlanta, the number one scoring offense. They put up the most points of any team in the NFL this season. And surprisingly, I don't think a lot of people realize this, but the New England Patriots actually had the number one defense in terms of points against in the NFL this entire regular season. Both teams have really picked up where they left off. From the right end of the regular season, the Falcons, they have just carried that momentum right on into the Super Bowl. Same with the Patriots. Both teams really pretty much dominating their competition. Yeah, there were a couple stumbles here and there, but for the most part, their games were never really in question. They were pretty much led from the beginning till the end the whole way. So again, the, I think we're looking at the two best teams in the NFL in the Super Bowl here, and that's what I'm excited about because, in my opinion, we don't get that a lot in the Super Bowl. Uh, we end up getting a lot of times where it's maybe the best team from one conference and maybe another team that just happened to get hot at the end or maybe one of the other teams suffered a bad injury or, you know, there could be a, a multitude of different things that would have caused it so that maybe we're not getting, in my opinion, the best two teams. So, I, again, I'm a big fan of this matchup. I'm really excited to watch this one. I will be getting uh, together with a bunch of my friends having a Super Bowl party, so I'm very, very excited for this one. But, what we're going to be doing, guys, is taking a look first at some of the games that we've seen recently in the playoffs. So I want to talk about the Patriots versus the Steelers that we saw on Sunday Night Football. Obviously, Tom Brady, man, unbelievable stuff once again. Brady was 32 of 42, 384 yards and three touchdowns against the Steelers. Really not a difficult matchup for him at all. I mean, he pretty much carved up that defense and did everything that he wanted to do against them. Not only that, but the Patriots on the defensive side of the ball, they held Roethlisberger to just one touchdown and he threw an interception. He threw for a decent number of yards, but a lot of that came in garbage time when the game was already pretty pretty much over, and the Patriots were basically willing to give them yardage in lieu of giving up points. So that's kind of what it ended up being. Obviously, Roethlisberger, from a fantasy standpoint, had still an okay game, but uh, you know, from a standpoint of actually putting points on the board, they just didn't do enough. Now, of course, a lot of that had to do with the fact that their running back and realistically their MVP, Le'Veon Bell, was injured, and that was a big play that happened early in the game. Uh, Le'Veon Bell was going up the middle of the pile, and he basically just, it looked like his uh, foot got caught in the turf, kind of messed up his knee a little bit, and uh, we just, or his groin, excuse me, I think it was his groin that ended up being uh, the injury that he suffered, but guys, I mean, that was a big momentum swing. Obviously, D'Angelo Williams came in and played really well. I mean, he caught quite a few passes. I think it was like seven passes, like 50 yards or somewhere along those lines. He wasn't particularly effective running the ball. He did actually break off a couple of decent runs, but for the most part, it was pretty much two yards and a cloud of dust for D'Angelo. So we have to assume that Le'Veon Bell would have done a little bit better than that. And in that case, it might have opened things up for other players in the offense. 
But once Bell went down, man, you could just see the momentum. I mean, it was already in New England's favor at that point, but it really went in their favor after that. And the, the Patriots just never let off the gas. They just continued to slam it down uh, the Falcons' throat on the defensive side of the ball. And, uh, you know, it was a pretty easy day for Brady and the Patriots. Now, on the other side here, the Atlanta Falcons. I have to admit something, guys, before I go too deep into this. A lot of you know that at the beginning of this playoffs, I actually predicted that Atlanta would lose to Seattle in the divisional round. I was very, very wrong about that, and it was a misanalysis on my part of the Atlanta Falcons because I didn't believe that this team truly had, number one, the offensive firepower. I I, I know they led the league in scoring, but I didn't think that they would just be able to go out there and beat the crap out of that Seattle defense in the way that they did. And uh, to be honest with you, though, when they did that, when they thoroughly dominated the Seahawks and I saw the way that they just crushed that defense, I was quite confident that they would do the same thing to Green Bay. I mean, you look at Green Bay and it was, uh, you know, in in my opinion, it was basically that Green Bay was a worse version of Atlanta. Yeah, both teams could pass the ball. But the Falcons could also run the ball, and their defense could get after the quarterback, and that's something that Green Bay just wasn't able to do. So that's where I believe the big difference was, and that's why I picked Atlanta to beat Green Bay, despite all the hate that I got in my comment section on that most recent prediction video that I did. I knew, or I, I shouldn't say I knew, I was very confident that Atlanta was going to win that game, and uh, it really wasn't surprising to me that Atlanta kind of ran away with it early. And the big reason for that, to be honest with you, is uh, offensively, Matt Ryan has been unbelievable this whole season. I really think that he is going to win the NFL MVP award. And then this most recent game against the Packers, he threw for 392 yards and four touchdowns. That's coming after a big 300-plus yard performance, three touchdown performance against the Seahawks as well. He also ran for a touchdown against the Packers, showing off some of that mobility that we don't really see from him all that often. But when he does do it, he's actually quite effective. He rarely takes big hits, and he's usually picking up first downs or running into the end zone for a touchdown. So he's a smart runner when he does run, which, again, isn't all that often. But the Falcons in this one, they weren't all that effective running the football against the Packers. If you really look at it, I mean, they were pretty effective at running against Seattle. Now, granted, a lot of that was due to the fact that really they didn't need to run the ball considering how effective Matt Ryan was in passing the ball. But it is kind of interesting that they didn't decide to actually go and, you know, just cram the ball down Green Bay's throat with the running game, especially late in the game. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that, of course, Green Bay's secondary was quite depleted from what they were at the beginning of the season. They were going with guys who were undrafted free agents and, you know, free agency acquisitions and just guys who, yeah, they've played decently in their positions this season, but they were just overmatched against that high-powered Atlanta offense. So it, it makes sense, of course, that they were going to try and pass the ball and take advantage of the thing that they're best at on the offensive side of the ball, especially when you take a look at Julio Jones. I mean, Green Bay just had no answer for this guy. He was dealing with a bunch of nagging injuries, and he was still unbelievable in this game. Nine receptions, 180 yards, two touchdowns, one of the craziest breakaway, stiff arm a guy, and breakaway for a huge touchdown receptions that I have seen, especially in that type of a moment. I mean, Julio Jones has just come to play in this playoffs, and it is going to be quite difficult for anyone to shut him down. Mohamed Sanu also quietly has scored in both playoff games. I I mean, they're finding ways to get the ball to their running backs out of the backfield. Atlanta's passing game just looks on another level right now. And I think it's going to be difficult for the Patriots to stop that. But what's interesting here is that the Patriots on the opposite side of the ball, despite the fact that they've actually been quite good at running the ball this season, they've actually struggled a little bit in the playoffs running the football. Now, it's true that they, again, just like Atlanta, haven't necessarily needed to run the ball. But when you got a guy like LeGarrette Blunt and you're talking about a bad weather game like the one that we saw against the Steelers, it's a little bit surprising that we didn't see a little bit more of LeGarrette Blunt, that we didn't see a little bit more of them trying to run the ball, control the clock, especially when the game was already kind of out of reach for Pittsburgh. We still really didn't see a lot of LeGarrette Blunt, And I think that's a little bit surprising. But keep in mind, too, Atlanta really wasn't tested by the Packers or the Seahawks who both really haven't run the ball well at all this whole season, and both of those teams fell behind early in those games, which kind of caused the game script to mean that both the Packers and the Seahawks would have to pass the ball quite often. So 
I do think that there's a possibility that the Patriots will actually get back to the running game in the Super Bowl. Now, I'm not expecting it to be LeGarrette Blunt and, you know, the Deion Lewis and uh, the James White show by any means. I think it's still going to be the Tom Brady experiment, you know, uh, or Tom Brady experience, I should say, throwing the football and really, you know, controlling that whole offense. But I do think that there's going to be a little bit more of a balanced attack. I, I just, I, I foresee that happening for some reason in this game. The Patriots have actually played quite a bit of bend but don't break defense, which could actually lead to the Falcons themselves utilizing their running backs in the passing game. And you guys know Devonta Freeman, Tevin Coleman, probably one of the best one-two punch running back combinations in the NFL, if not the best. And both of them are effective at not only running the ball, but also pe catching passes out of the backfield. And actually, both of them are decent blockers out of the backfield as well. So that makes things quite difficult for defenses because when somebody is on the field, you just don't know what they're going to do. There are a lot of teams where, you know, like for example, on New England's side of the ball, if LeGarrette Blunt's on the field, there's a pretty good chance that they're going to be running the ball. Now, when a guy like James White or a guy like Deion Lewis is on the field, there's a much better chance that they're going to be passing. It's not obviously 100% of the time, but you're going to see a substantial difference in the, the willingness of the Patriots to run the ball or pass the ball, depending on who is on the field. With Atlanta, they make it very, very difficult on defense because you really do not know what they're going to do. Now, for New England, Chris Hogan and Julian Edelman have been unbelievable in the playoffs so far. And to be honest with you, in looking at this matchup, I actually do expect another nice game out of at least one of those guys. I think it's going to be Julian Edelman. And the reason that I say that is because Atlanta's secondary has been quite depleted this season. I mean, they obviously lost Desmond Trufant earlier this season, and it's been tough for them to keep up with other receivers. But when they actually look at a guy like Julian Edelman, he is the kind of guy that can really exploit a less you know, experienced, a less skilled, a less quick secondary. And I think that's where the difference is going to be here. I think Edelman, obviously he's a tough matchup for anybody, but I just don't see anybody in that Atlanta secondary that can really keep up with him out of the slot. That's going to be a very interesting matchup to watch, in my opinion. The other one for the Patriots is that the Falcons were one of the worst teams in the NFL at defending tight ends this season. So Martellus Bennett could be somebody to watch in this game. He's been really quiet so far in the playoffs, but can you imagine if he's the guy that's actually able to get the job done and to, to really exploit that defense? Keep in mind that the Packers scored with their tight end, Jared Cook, against this Atlanta defense, and also the Seahawks scored with Jimmy Graham, their tight end, against this Atlanta defense. So I think there's a real good possibility that Martellus Bennett could get into the end zone in this game, and I think that they're going to have to do a lot to really focus on making sure that he does not become a major contributor in this football game. By the way, can you imagine how ridiculously difficult it would be for Atlanta to stop Rob Gronkowski if he were healthy in this game? I think Gronk by himself could make this a bigger one or maybe even a two-point difference. We already have uh, the early lines right now as of when I'm recording this video is that the Patriots are a three-point favorite. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a four or five-point favorite if Gronk was playing. Obviously, that's you know completely not going to happen, but something to think about anyway, how different this game could be. Now, for the Falcons, I think one of Atlanta's biggest advantages that they have had against the two teams that they have played so far this season uh, in the playoffs, which was Seattle and Green Bay, is that their pass rush has done a tremendous job of getting after the opposing quarterbacks. Now, they aren't going out there and getting five, six sacks a game in these contests, but what they're doing is they're keeping the opposing quarterbacks in the pocket. Russell Wilson and, and Aaron Rodgers were both two of the best out-of-the-pocket quarterbacks in the league, just guys that can extend the play, get their receivers open, things like that. The Falcons pack ru pass rush, they get around the outside, and they contain the quarterback, and it makes things very, very difficult for those more mobile guys that try to get out of the pocket. Even though Aaron Rodgers threw for 287 yards and three touchdowns, a lot of that came in garbage time, and like I said, he just wasn't able to get those extensions. The play clock was just, it just wasn't in his favor. He just wasn't able to get the ball to his receivers down the field often enough. And honestly, that's what Dallas couldn't do against Aaron Rodgers. Rodgers had 8.3 yards per attempt against the Cowboys. He had two yards per attempt less against the, the Falcons. 
that just goes to show you. I think you know a lot of people would contribute that to Atlanta secondary being better than Dallas's. I don't even think that's true necessarily. It might be better, but I don't think it's substantially better. The big difference, in my opinion, was that pass rush. Vic Beasley coming off the edge. Just it's it's so difficult for a guy like Rodgers and even for a guy like Russell Wilson to to see that coming and not allow it to cause them problems and and force them to throw the ball earlier than they otherwise would have against op- other opposing defenses. Now Tom Brady himself is, in my opinion, not going to be a guy that's going to be as affected by that as an Aaron Rodgers or especially a Russell Wilson. Tom Brady was only sacked 15 times in 12 games this regular season. The Patriots offensive line has been amazing throughout the regular season, and uh, it's really picked up in the playoffs. Yeah, Brady was under a little bit of pressure in the Houston game particularly, but against Pittsburgh, yeah, they gave up two sacks, but other than that, he really was not under pressure much, and the reason for that is because he gets the ball out quickly. He doesn't allow opposing pass rushers to get around the outside and cause him headaches. He He just doesn't give them time. So that's going to be, I think, one of the most interesting things to watch. Obviously, if Atlanta can get to him, it's going to cause some problems, but I don't think that's necessarily going to happen. On the Falcons' side of the ball, in my opinion, Julio Jones is going to have to be the playmaker that really wins them this game. And the matchup to watch here is Malcolm Butler lined up against Julio Jones. It's going to be one of the most important things in this entire game, in my opinion. In fact, I think it could be the thing that flips the momentum one way or the other, depending on what happens. If Malcolm Butler can at least contain Julio and not have a ton of extra help like he did against Antonio Brown and DeAndre Hopkins, he it was pretty much one-on-one the majority of the game. The Falcons could be in some serious trouble if Julio is contained in one-on-one coverage. Now, if Malcolm Butler ends up needing some additional help too often, that's going to leave other players open and could potentially lead to some big gashes, particularly in the running game and even in the, the receiving game with those running backs like we talked about before. Now, this has been a big staple of the Atlanta offense this season. When Julio Jones has had those games where he struggled, it typically led to actual pro- better production out of the running game because defenses were f- so focused on trying to take Julio Jones out of the game that they just let their run running game fall to shambles. The tough thing for Atlanta is that Devin McCourty, the Patriots safety, is one of the best coverage safeties in the league, which allows New England to do a lot of unique things. They give a lot of unique looks that other teams just aren't able to do. And the Patriots are confident that McCourty can cover wide receivers or tight ends one-on-one. And that allows them to send heat from unique angles or mix up coverages, which can lead to a lot of miscommunications. And we actually saw that this past week uh, on Sunday when Ben Roethlisberger threw an interception. He thought he saw one thing. The receiver thought he saw something else. And it led to a very easy interception for the Patriots defense. There wasn't even a lot of pressure on Roethlisberger on that play. It was just complete miscommunication because they weren't on the same page. They didn't see the same thing in the defense. And really, you have to give the Patriots secondary a a lot of credit there because they were the ones who really forced that miscommunication and that interception. And again, it was a very easy interception. It wasn't like the the, uh, defensive back made a great play on the ball or anything like that. It was pretty much right to him. Now, Logan Ryan on the other side of the of the field from uh, Malcolm Butler, he's actually played quite well in the second half of the season, and the Patriots might even be comfortable leaving him on an island against Mohamed Sanu. Sanu is not a superstar wide receiver by any means, but he's certainly, like I said before, been a guy who has been effective in the playoffs, and he's had some big games in the regular season as well. Now, Matt Ryan is still capable of exploiting the New England defense even if you do see guys you know, with uh, like a Malcolm Butler, if he is able to contain Julio Jones, I still think that you're going to see Matt Ryan have a successful game, but it's going to quite require a lot of excellent pre-snap reads against the defense, and it's going to require extraordinarily accurate passes. And I, again, Matt Ryan is the kind of guy that can do that, but it makes things much more difficult when the Patriots are able to do what they can on defense. In my opinion, guys, this is one of the most difficult games that I have had to predict. I think it's the most difficult game to actually predict going into it of this entire playoffs. You have the experience of the Patriots. You have the hunger of the Falcons. I mean, again, this is a super exciting game for me. I'm really excited for it. And one of the things that you're going to hear throughout the next two weeks leading into this game is that Tom Brady has struggled in the Super Bowl against teams that could rush the passer with four-man fronts. 
And I'll tell you guys, that's something that Atlanta has been great at this season. Obviously, Vic Beasley led the NFL in sacks. However, I think this is a different New England team than in the past, and I think Brady has been absolutely tremendous with pre-snap reads this season. I don't think he's going to allow the Falcons to rush for and you know just get after him like that. I, I think he's going to be able to get the ball out to the receiver that's open, and again, I think it's going to be a nice day for Julian Edelman. Atlanta's an excellent team, guys, uh, and I, I think I, I have a feeling that they would beat any other team in the league going into this game. If Atlanta was matched up against any team from the AFC or hypothetically if they would have been pulled from a team from the NFC, I think that they would beat any of those teams. I think Atlanta is the second best team in the NFL this season. It's just unfortunate because they're getting matched up against what I believe to be the best team in the NFL. Before the the playoffs started, I picked New England to win the whole thing, and I'm going to stick with that. The Patriots were the NFL's best regular season team. They've really done nothing to show in the playoffs that they're not still the best team. So I'm taking New England by a final score of 30 to 27. I think it's, again, it's going to be a great game, very close. But I do believe that Brady's experience and just the whole coaching staff in New England having that experience, I think it's going to play a major factor. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Again, if you did, please do me a favor and drop a like. Comment below as well. Let me know what you guys think about the video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Thanks again, and I will talk to you guys again soon.